actual like first family like ancestors came to Santa Monica. Um, I graduated from Santa Clara University, and then I ended up um, not quite knowing what I wanted to do after. So I moved home and started working for a catering company in Pasadena, and then did that for a year, and then moved on and moved to Aspen, Colorado, and cooked there for a while, and was encouraged by a sous chef to go to culinary school. So I went to culinary school in New Hyde Park, New York, and then... After culinary school, I worked for a bunch of great chefs. I worked for Alice Waters at Chez Panisse. I worked for um, Michael Mina. I worked for, um, I worked in New York under a chef named Greg Koontz. And so I kind of just always worked for amazing people. I, I didn't um, necessarily want to own the fine dining restaurants that they owned, but I thought it was a great stepping stone to learn the proper way to cook and just learn from the best. And then I was in New York and my mom was like, it's time to come home. And so I, it, it had been, I'd been away from LA for at least 10 years at that point, um, San Francisco, Colorado and uh, New York. And then I ended up moving back to Los Angeles and I started my own catering business. And I did start it illegally out of my home, <laughs> which I wouldn't recommend doing, but I, I honestly didn't know about any of these kitchens. Like I, I just didn't even know you could rent a kitchen. So I, I started doing it and it just grew like crazy. The first year, like maybe I did a hundred thousand in sales. And then the second year it was 200. And then the third year it was three. And it just, it was really just me um, doing wow. it all by myself. And then I had have staff that would go work with me at the parties. Um, so it was pretty intense. And then um, it's just, it's very physical. So it's, it, you know, from doing the shopping to putting it all away to cooking all day. And um, it, it was, it was interesting. And then going to the parties and actually serving at the parties. But I didn't have a chef to do that. I was the chef. And then um, just finding staff and booking people and doing all the paperwork. So then did that for probably like three years. And then meanwhile, I had found this building that, not this one, but my restaurant's building. And we were working on building that out. And that was a whole nother process because I've never built anything. Um, you know, I, we lived in the same home our whole lives. I've never seen construction really. But my husband is very, he's done a lot of this construction. So he sort of managed the product. It, I started on the wrong foot and then moved it to the right foot with like an architect. I mean, you have to do it. You have to follow the rules. And especially in Santa Monica, more than anything, you need to follow the rules because they're coming by, they're checking, they're, you know, holding you accountable for every move um, in the construction process and with the health department and, and they, all the everything kind of needs to be in conjunction with each other, yeah. like the health department, the building department, it, you can't do one without the other. It all needs to be approved. So then it, did, it took me over a year to build it out, which is a bit long. Um, it should have taken nine months, but it took longer because I, I didn't really fully know what I was doing. And then um, from day one, we opened in the recession um, and we, it was that there was a line out the door. I think it was 08, we opened 09. I, I like should know, but um, <laughs> I mean, I'm like looking up, we have our first dollar up there. I'm trying to find the date on it. I think it's 09. Anyway, so um, yeah, it was interesting because it was the, the world seemed like it was falling apart in so many areas. Um, but I think so many restaurants had gone out and people were so excited to have something coming in that was new. Um, I also think Ocean Park, it's a funny area because I think they were so like, why are you building this here? And so grateful. But I also think Ocean Park has its challenges. Like it's not <laughs> like being on Montana. Like I think on Montana, you just have a built-in business, you know? Yeah, the traffic. Yeah, I mean, you pay more rent, but you get more, way more traffic. But um, you know, we have, a great little business here. And it's, it's definitely done fine during 
this whole period pandemic. Um, we're really built for this, which, I mean, obviously I never even thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. I never, we've never been faced with anything like this. You know, I thought last year when we had a water main explode a block away and it like somehow triggered the electricity to like short, and this was a block away and we were out of power and water for over a week. Wow. And I was losing my mind. I mean, because I was like, this is crazy. I'm losing money every day we're closed. And when are we going to open? And um, it's weird. I've almost been calmer through this pandemic. Which is, <laughs> because I, I don't know, there was, I think it's just a loss, no control, you know? Yeah. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's been a very interesting time. This, so I own my own time. I, and then about, I've had this for 11 years. Now I've had, um, I've had local for five years and local is, a it's a, like kind of fine dining. It's, it's got pizzas and pastas and all that. It's just a block away. Um, it's a lot of fun. I don't spend as much time there as I do here. There I have a chef, I have a GM, I have, which I do have here too, but here there's just a lot more going on. It's just, yeah. in, I have children, so it's a daytime job. So I'm home at night with my kids. And Ooh, look at you. Um, yes, I mean, I, I've made a point that that's what I want. And anyway, so local though has suffered a lot more during this pandemic. It's just, it's a dine-in. Is dine-in only? What's that? Is dine-in only? Is, yeah. And then we transitioned, you know, it's, you know, there's certain pizza places, I think like, like John and Vinny's, I don't know if you've heard of it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they really do a ton of takeout. Um, we never did. And so we really had to create that during this pandemic and like sign up with Postmates and Grubhub and all these things, um, which has been fine. I mean, I'm not crazy about Postmates and all that. I mean, mm -hmm. it really... I think the reason you do that is to more so like turn product because uh -huh. they take a solid 20 plus percent, you know, of what you're making, which is at the end of the day, probably your profit, you know? Yeah. Um, so you're just doing it to keep your staff employed and you're doing it to turn food over. So it stays fresh and all that. But um, yeah, so we've suffered down there a lot more, but I, I mean, I built out the patio, I built out the front patio, I built out you know, and all of that, I mean, ours is pretty minimal, but it's thousands of dollars of just sort of a band-aid. We did like a picket fence and I had the tables, but we strung string lights and stuff. So that's been very, um, it's been interesting. And then finally people were kind of like a, the first week people were like, yeah, no, we're not sitting in a parking lot. <laughs> and then the second week they're like, this is kind of fun. And then it just became like exciting for people and fun. Mm -hmm. And then they took it away. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're back to takeout. But, um, you know, we're trying constantly to pivot. I mean, here I've had more success at that time. I've had more success. I mean, cookie kits, we did Cinco de Mayo boxes. We've done we were feeding hospitals for a, a while at the very beginning. Um, I don't know, everything we've tried here, it really like has been fun and kind of taken off, which is awesome. We did a fried chicken Friday, which people would, could get chicken and coleslaw. And, you know, now we're doing like, I was like, let's do mole Monday. And so we're going to do a chicken mole on Mondays. And, nice. you know, so we try and do like different fun themes. I did, um, oh, my school was throwing a tiki party for their um, auction, like sort it was called Ohana. And they asked me to kind of team up with them. So we did tiki boxes with like Mai Tai and tiki glasses and stuff. And then we did a full tiki meal. And I said, let's just send this to the customers. And sure enough, customers started buying. I think people were just like, I need something new, you know? Yeah. So over just the same dinner and the same this, but it's been good. And then we also kind of picked up delivering to all over town. So we'd have like Monday would be the Valley, Tuesday would be oh. Westwood. Yeah. So, and then we even picked up Newport Beach because I have a lot of family in Newport. 
Oh, and wow. Newport is so funny because that's where it took off. So we, the first week we had 20 deliveries to Newport, second week, 25, you know, so it's fun. I guess if I'm opening another place, it's probably Newport. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it was, it was actually kind of turned into a funny thing to test the market. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought the Valley was going to be like, call in and be like, oh my gosh, we get free delivery on Tuesdays. Nobody called from the Valley, you know? I had wow. like a friend that called and I was like, oh gosh, it's my friend, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's funny, you know, it's been, it's been a challenging time, but it's also been a very inspiring time. I mean, you just, there's been no sitting around, no boredom. It's just been like head go, like spinning. What can we do next? What can we, you know, so, and I'm kind of feed on that energy. I definitely... I don't stop all day and then I crash at like 8.30, you know? So. I so get that spinning. Unfortunately, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you know, being a caterer too, like you just have to improvise. I mean, you'll be at a home and all of a sudden the ovens breaks on you and you're yeah. like, oh my God. Like, and there's that initial like panic. And then there's like, okay, I have to deal and I have to deal right now. So that has been, I had a lot of practice at that. And (laughs) I do think it's an amazing life skill, Um, you know? So um, I don't know, does that give you a good sense of- It does, it gives me an idea of how you navigate the terrain of success and how you're able to, well, you were trained earlier on apparently on how to pivot. Yeah, I'm I'm one of six kids. Yes. Yeah. So now you're like a swirling dervish. You're like, whoa. Yeah. I mean, our family, there's three type one diabetics that were kids. Like, so you'd go on a trip and someone would end up in the hospital. And I mean, there's always something happening, you know, and you're just like, okay, I guess we're going to the hospital or I guess we're going, you know, but yeah. So so in regards to uh, where you are now, how would you say, because we're looking um, sort of to guide people yeah. Along this journey. So like I was sharing with you that I did not have, I, it, it wasn't planned. Yeah. I have the roadmap. And so one of the things we're looking to do is to support people on this journey and sort yeah. of show people the possibilities, because if someone sees you working and they see what you're doing, there is no clue how you arrived there. Yeah. I mean, so there's a few things I think, I think I would get experience in the field, in whatever you want to do, like Mm -hmm. experience in cooking or experience in restaurants, experience in, you know, a retail store, whatever it is someone wants to do should be inspired enough to go and work in that industry. And Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to work in it for 10 years, but um, I do think experience is a good thing. And then I think you quickly learn when you are working, which I did, um, that like, I didn't want to do fine dining. I don't ever want to be a polishing silver at two in the morning and getting into bed after that. Like, that's just not who I am at all. I'm a daytime person. I'm a casual person. Um, I I don't love working on the line. So like Mm -hmm. what we do here is very different. It's like, we're making salads for 20 people and everybody's sort of gathered around the kitchen. Whereas in a full service restaurant, there's a line and it's like, you you are just saute and all you're doing is sauteing and all you're doing is grilling. Like for me, I like to take a dish from the start to the finish. Um, So I, I learned that early on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, and I kind of learned my style and my speed through the people that I worked for, which was awesome. Like, cause that's so much of a part of being a chef is, mm-hmm. um, speed and knowing how to season and flavor and, you know, and knowing your style, you know, your so style how did you, mind. how did you, how did you learn your style? Because there's some young chefs in Santa Monica who, you know, they go through a short program and they learn a couple things. And it's like, Oh, I know how to cook. Yeah. Or, um, you know, with the knife skills in that, there's certain knife skills that are just so essential for a certain type of cuisine. Yeah. Um, and so how would you even suggest that someone finds their style? Because I know for myself, I'm a little bit reluctant 
to say certain things because people need to find their way yeah. to just through the volume of cooking. Yeah. I mean, so much of it is experience. Like, I mean, you, first, first of all, like, and I think you would agree with me, I wouldn't even go down the cooking path unless you love to cook. Like I, it, it is such a hard career that I, if you're going to do it, you got to love it. I mean, otherwise go, you can make more money somewhere else and not smell like fish every day. You know what I mean? I mean, I kind of always have felt that way. So anyway, I think experience, but like for me, I work for other people and I mm -hmm. learned the skills. And then I felt like when I became a private chef for a family, every single day I cooked something different for them. I mean, they weren't picky. So I would just scour through books. I, I, you know, I was in, I would make different soups every day. I would make all the stuff and I, and then I taste, you have to taste everything. I mean, I still taste everything every day. I kind of go through and, you know, if, and you can almost see it too with your eyes. Yeah. And you're like, that seems off. And then you taste it and you're like, yep, I knew it. <laughs> you know, that chocolate chocolate didn't look like it did yesterday or this or that, you know. But um, that's how I really got my confidence um, because I do think I was one of those people that, when I was working in a restaurant, the chef would be like, this is the recipe. And I'd be like one quarter cup. Like I, I felt like I needed to like memorize recipes where uh -huh. I think the more experience you get, I mean, you have to have, we have recipes here for every single dish um, because you have to have consistency. But I think right. a true solid chef or to figure out your style, you, you can't just depend on some recipe you know, you can use them as like a, like a vantage point, but like, I don't think that you can be tied to someone else's recipes. If that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. But I do think, I mean, with anything in life, it's experience and, and a lot of it is confidence through trial and error. Um, I, it took me a while. I'll tell you, it definitely took me a solid 10 years and then even when I opened the restaurant, it wasn't like I felt like, oh, this is so easy. I mean, every day it was like, wake up at four in the morning, get here, head down, work so hard. And, you know, I mean, every time I think I've like, I can't even think of the most recent, well, the pandemic is one of them. Like every year I'm like, oh, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And then something happens and I'm like, oh my God, I never would have thought, you know? from, I don't even know, like a, a customer complaint to a pandemic to a little kid, like taking his hand one time, I'll never forget this. He took his hand and he's dragging it along the front glass case. Somehow he got his little finger stuck in like one of the grooves on the true case. And sure enough, it's blood everywhere. It's like, it was like a bloodbath, you wow. know? So you just like, you have no clue, you know? And I mean, it's just every day is a new day, you know? Oh, that's a so, story yeah. of success. Yeah. I did have a guy um, who was awesome to me. Like when I was opening and I really, he sat down with me for like two hours and he like started linen company, told me about what, what to expect with a linen company, produce company, what to expect with a produce company. He just went down the list and I, I'll never forget too. He was kind of like with a lot of stuff too. He was like, don't worry. He goes, you have insurance for a reason. And he was like, there is a cost of doing business. And he's like, so if something is wrong, you know, there's a cost of doing business. You can't just hold on to every dollar or every. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of times that maybe we are right, but we just, the customer is always right, you know? Yeah no matter what. Yeah. yeah. So once you found your style and you created uh, both of your places, how did you expand? So it took me a while. Like I definitely, I opened this as a, it had everything it has now. It, it did. Oh. It had, yeah. So it had um, the catering, it had the gourmet to go and it had the cafe. So it is what it still is today, mm -hmm. just on a different level. Um, the other thing that's been interesting in this pandemic, I, I'll be honest, is I think in a business, you get to this point that you start hiring people and hiring people. And then, you know, 
you start making less and less because you're hiring people to do a lot of this stuff. And I think what this pandemic has shown me is that what you need is a really good solid core group. You don't always need more isn't always more. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we've kind of gone back to those first days of when I did open where like we had, I had a director of operations and I, I was like, I don't think I need a director of operations anymore. Like I can handle that with, you know, my general managers. Mm -hmm. And I just think some of that, you know, I think it's really easy to keep hiring, but it's not always necessary, you know? Um, what, where, what did you ask me though? I forgot. <laughs> expansion. Oh, expansion. So yeah. then it took me a long time. I mean, the first year I'm open, I was open. I mean, everyone was coming out of the woodwork. You got to open another one of these, I'll back you, I'll back you. And I don't know. I mean, I knew I wanted to have kids, so I've never opened another one of these. I am tempted by it again, but honestly, I don't even know, I don't know how I could do it. Like I, I'm so involved here. Mm -hmm. Um, even sometimes going down to local is hard because it's like they get down there at the end of the day and I'm kind of feel like tired and done. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's two ways of doing it. Like I, I truly do think if you're going to be like in there and working and like really, really, really involved, you might not want to expand too much. Um, mm -hmm. Mine are all on one block. So it makes things easier. Um, I also think, I mean, you have to hire people you really trust and care about is, is for expansion. Yeah. But it took me a solid five years to even open local. Um, and they're like right next door, pretty much, you know, um, and my husband's constantly pushing me to open another one. <laughs> I'm like, you do the work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I, I would love to, but like, is it vanity or is it something I really want? You yeah. know what I mean? And I think yeah. you really need to think about that. I think it's, it's really important to think about that. So, so like, um, how is the, what's the culture? Did you anticipate the culture of Ocean Park? And then you begin to reach out beyond that. I mean, we know, I don't know how you came about that as you're taking over Ocean Park. Yeah, you're so bad. You know, Ocean <laughs> Park was a funny thing. So we were looking for spaces and then everywhere we were looking, and my husband was actually, we were dating at the time. He was my broker. So, and he's a friend of my brother's. So anyway, he was um, showing me around places and just nothing seemed right. Like either there was no parking or there was no, it, it seemed like it was so small that it wasn't something that I could grow with. There was just no possibility of that. And so my restaurant's 2,500 square feet and it's been good. And now we have the building next door. I rent the building next door and my offices are here. What's and next the, door? Is that the hobby shop? Well, the toy store. The hobby the shop toy is store. Gone. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, cool. I, it wasn't the hobby shop, but it's right next door. It's called Quinny and B. And so it's uh -huh. a, a little toy store that I, it's my, it's mine as well. So it's named after my girls. But, and is it uh, a toy store? It's a toy store. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we just reopened it this month. It's been closed the whole time. So oh, congratulations. That was thing. Like we took all the toys and we put them in time because we couldn't have any seating. So then that just took off. Like the toys really, we sold more toys at time than we ever did. At the <laughs> <store>. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. It's, it, it, you know, it's been a good block. It definitely, I definitely sometimes go down that road of God, if we were on Montana, like, or if I was on, I don't even know, even main street would, we be able to do more business, mm -hmm. not as much with time. I think about that, but more even with, um, more with local, even mm -hmm. you know? that type Ocean of Park crowd sleepy Ocean Park is very sleepy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I love the people of Ocean Park. They're way, they're super down to earth. Um, mm -hmm. they're super grateful to have us here. Um, you know, it just isn't, it's not as fast. It's a little bit more mellow. Yeah. yeah. Did your business change at all with the schools being closed? 
Does that affect? It has, it has, you know, we had a huge, so Friday, I think they all have late start, all the public schools around here. Mm -hmm. All the moms would come in with their kids and it's all, and also, you know, all these moms are homeschooling now, so they're not going out and getting their latte after they drop off. And oh yeah. yeah. So we've definitely been impacted, you know, but we've also like pulled back on how much food we're buying and how much labor we're employing. So yeah, that's awesome. a constant struggle in this business. I mean, is balancing your labor and balancing your food costs and all that, you know, cause that can change, that can change week to week quick. Yeah. And so you buy a lot of local, you shop local, right? A lot of your, we, have, we do have vendors that we use there. I mean, all LA vendors, we're not completely organic. Um, it's just not our clientele. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked for organic, we can do it, you know, but um, we definitely buy seasonal and we buy really fresh. It just, our, our customer is not going to pay, you know, mm -hmm. double or whatever, even a, a two thirds or a third more for organic. And, and Maura, who are your, your catering clients? Are they the same people that yeah. buy lattes there? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of them are actually, it is. Um, a lot of our, like our sweet spot, I would say is dinner parties from like 30 to 75. We don't do a lot of things that are, you know, a thousand. Mm -hmm. um, we have done them, but we work a lot with local schools like the Marymount, Marlboro, Loyola, um, Brentwood, like a lot of them mm -hmm. us for stuff, Crossroads. And then um, we do a lot of private homes, a lot of private homes. Mm. So, yeah. And then on the gourmet to go side, we do a lot of corporate. So, Excellent. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So Michael, I was wondering if anyone has any questions, any of our viewers have any questions, you can um, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Hi Flo. Let's see, I can't even see the chat, okay. Let's see, more, is it, more isn't always more. More isn't always more. Such a good message. Oh, thank you. Hey. Yeah. Any questions from anyone? So how old are your children? I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, two little girls. Oh my so, God, you're so yeah. ambitious. It's fun, they're good. That's awesome. Yeah, they're good girls. They love coming here. They get spoiled by my general manager, big time. <laughs> Cookies, toys. <laughs> how did you come? How did you come up with your different kits and your different themes? You just go for something that's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we, I'm on Instagram a lot. Like, I don't. I don't have a personal Instagram. Like, I could. I don't post my. I post my kids sometimes on my work sites, especially on Quinny and B because, you know, it's the toy store. Uh-huh. I literally like, I'm like, guys, you're my model and you can keep one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, they, um, I'm constantly looking. I am, I'm so constantly curious, you know, and I'm, I do, I mean, she's been a lot, my general managers behind me, but you know, I feel <laughs> like I'm, I, I'm super supported. So I'll come in and be like, what do you think of this? Oh then, yeah. Like, they'll be like, great idea. Like I'm definitely a collaborator. Oh, wonderful. Sometimes, sometimes in an annoying way, I, I'm like, <laughs> what do you think of this? What should we do about this? What do you think? And you know, it's, it's been awesome. Like everyone's been like, let's try it. Let's do it. You know, which is such a fun energy to have. Yeah. yeah. It's so wide open. So one of the questions in the chat is what was your process when you created your menu? Well, I knew I wanted sandwiches and salads. So I started there. Like I knew I wanted a cafe. Um, so I started with the things that I would want. I mean, and we've dabbled in like, you know, bowls weren't a thing when I was um, just opening. It wasn't, and then bowls kind of became a thing. We've dabbled in that. I don't feel like it's our thing. Like we are definitely like soup salad sandwich here at the cafe. And then we have a huge front case. I don't know who's been here or who hasn't. Yeah, but I have. You can see it online too. 
But um, we have a huge front case with salads, like pasta salads and all this stuff. So people can buy it by the court, by the scoop, whatever. Um, so it just, it was very much that, just like starting with, you know, more of a cafe feel, like mm -hmm. what do you, do you want a restaurant? Or do you want a cafe, you know? And what is your cafe gonna do? Are you gonna, are you a coffee person? Like if you're a super coffee person, like I know, um, Oh my gosh, uh, zinc. No, not zinc. What's the one on? Um, oh my God, Earth Cafe. Oh yeah, like Earth Cafe. Like I know, I've talked to him before. So he is obsessed with tea, and his wife is obsessed with coffee. Oh, perfect. And so like they really have put so much focus on that. Their their focus is tea and coffee. Um, for me, I think it was just like good, yummy food that I'd want to eat really, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, I love it. So what's the favorite toy? Oh, in the kitchen? Oh God. Well, you have to love the Roboku. I yeah, mean, that's, <laughs> that's an expensive toy though. Um, we, I, I also, I've always loved like this, um, the rasp, the zester, uh -huh. you know, I do love that except for they get dull too fast. Yeah. Then what do you do with it? You toss it, right? Then you toss it. It's such a shame. I was looking at, I was like, is there a way to sharpen this thing? Not funny. Oh, you know what I do? I love, I love, I've always, I, I don't cook as much in the kitchen. You know, I'm not in there all the time anymore, but, um, the stock pot, like the single burner, like that's a standalone huge burner. Uh -huh. I love that thing. Cause you can, <laughs> you, you can get something bubbling so fast, you know? Oh, that was like one of my favorite things when I first opened. Someone wants to know what is a Robaku? It's, it's basically a fancy food processor. It's, I mean, actually not so fancy. It's a, do you know, like a, a Cuisinart? I don't know why I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any of these things. Oh, there it is. Oh, there. Yeah, it's a, it's a French term and it's a Cuisinart, um, more industrial. And the next one is, what is the most challenging part of budgeting for you? Probably labor. Yeah, I mean, over time, you know, break violations, all that stuff is very tough because in some of it, you know, you have to hold, you want your employee to be responsible to clock out on time, but you also as man, you have to have your managers constantly monitoring it. And when you're busy, it's hard to monitor that. So I love, I have to say that I love the way your kitchen is set up because since I've retired, the old model is that you would follow a recipe or a, or an item all the way through, but now everything is so segmented and fragmented that there's some person for everything. So I'm surprised to hear that, but I personally think that's more efficient. Yeah. You think that the old model, that your model is back or that, what, what actually was the purpose for those little models? Well, I, think, I think it's like an assembly line. So it uh -huh. works for a very small menu. Um, mm -hmm. That's. I mean, that's a whole nother thing. I think that's a tricky thing. I think the bigger the menu, the harder it is. We have a huge menu. Yeah. Um, if you have a real simple menu, like you're, I don't know, like a pizza place and you, you have mm -hmm. the best chop, like you have three salads, you have four pizzas and you've got- Same ingredients. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a lot easier to just knock it out. But um, we, I mean, we have, everything like I we've got curry on our menu we've got Mexican food on our menu we've got you know French things on our menu so it, it it's a harder deal here mm -hmm. um but it also creates a lot of options for people yeah have you ever worked with an induction burner um I have worked with an induction burner and so would you put that yeah. big pot would that be those are good we use them in pastry um, in pastry? It's, yeah, in pastries. So like they have an induction burner there that they use mm -hmm. for just like chocolate and things. Um, mm -hmm. Everything we use is like plugged in, you know, like it's it's like wall mounted, but like oh, okay. we'll pull that out, you know, for melting chocolate so that they don't have to go get in the way of the people on the burner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that electric's gonna be good for baking. Yeah. Between the burner and an electric convection, 
Yeah. Have it going on, Carla. <laughs> She's listening. <laughs> so are there any more questions for Maura? So what's going on in the restaurant right now? What can viewers come over there and taste and get or yeah, so for the ways that we can? We are all holiday. Like, so this week we've got um, Hanukkah starting. So we'll have a, we have a full Hanukkah menu online. Um, well, we do like traditional fare, brisket and latkes and things like that. Um, and then we are Christmas is everywhere here too. We've got, you know, cause I, we have a whole retail component as well. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of holiday shopping from, you know, poppers for the table to Christmas trees for decor in your home. So it that must be a lot of fun to shop for. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's cute too. Cause I do it with my mom. Um, so my mom and I go to, you know, we go to Las Vegas for a show. We will go to San Francisco. Sometimes we'll go downtown for the gift show. So mm -hmm. it's a fun thing for us to do together. Yeah, that is fun. Yeah. I miss the, I miss the shows. I know. I know. Seriously. What about gift baskets? Do you do any gift baskets for the home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do gift baskets and like some years they've been amazing. And then some years it's, I, I don't even know how, like, I've actually, that's a question I have for someone is like, how do you really get into the gift basket market? Um, there's, we do, we'll do like maybe 20 or 30 a season, but I mean, some of these people are cranking out thousands of them. Yeah. I think if you have, I think of that for me, I did a big bis gift basket clientele and it's the clients. Yeah. You have to ship though, right? You have to do huh? a lot of shipping, a lot of shipping. Yeah. 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 And, and a client will order 20 of them. See, that's so nice Come to everybody. Yeah. That, that's huge. And it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's like, kind of like boom, 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 yeah. boom, you know? Yeah. So, it's modular. Yeah. Yeah. How do you choose location to expand your business? Oh, I haven't figured that out yet. I think you got to feel it. You got to feel it in your blood. Like I really felt this one. I, when I pulled up to this location, I just was like, this is it. I knew. And then um, you got to really look into, I, I think you've got to look into the demographic. Like if you're doing something that's sort of fast food and easy, that's fine. Like you can be in a lower income area. If you're going to do something that's high end, like you've got to be in an area that people that are going to spend money want to go. Um, I would always say go for the more trafficked area. The problem with that is you're going to pay more rent. Um, but paying more rent shouldn't be a total turnoff because if you can do it, you know, if you can make that money, it, it could be worth it in the end. Yeah. And yeah, I'm right across from jams. Yep. I think someone wrote that. Yeah. And then Mulugeta says, how do you target your customers advertising and how do you determine the number, number of customers you're serving? So, um, so I have in the past had PR every time I've opened a restaurant, I have hired a PR company. Um, and I've done that at the beginning. Then a few years ago, I was like, ah, let's hire PR. And I'll be honest, every time I've hired VR, I feel like our sales have gone down. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm it's sorry. so much work. It's so bizarre. It's, um, it's a ton of work too, because you're constantly being hit up by the publicist to like either give people free food or write a column or do stuff. Um, so I'm not saying it's not worth it. It was a lot of fun. And same thing, it's a it's a bit of vanity, which is fun. All of a sudden you're in this magazine and you're in that magazine, but I don't think it all of a sudden, um, I don't think it guarantees more business. Um, I think it maybe gives you more publicity, like just more things to show your kids or <laughs> put in the pile. <laughs> but um, for me, it didn't really crank up my business. Um, one of the best things I got was a write-up in the LA Times. I think if you can get into the LA Times, People were coming. They, they, people read the LA Times and they food section, and they they came. Um, they came for the salmon that we did one time. But um, so I'm not a huge. I am very active on Instagram, and then I connect it with Facebook, and and I don't even know how to use Twitter. So, um, but yeah, I, I do think Instagram is such a good resource 
Um, and then just like the truth is, if your product is consistent, word of mouth is your best bet. Well, mm -hmm. still true after all these years. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, people talk, they talk, they love it. You know, everyone loves to tell the person like the next, oh, I just went here and it was great. Or yeah. it's terrible. They love to talk <laughs> bad too. You know? <laughs> Oh, so, delightful. Yeah. Any more questions, anyone? So you have Christmas Eve. Yep, we're open Christmas Eve, close Christmas Day. And so is that all pre-ordered at this it's point? All pre-order. You got to get your order in like probably a week in advance. And you have um, lots, like of soup, lots of soups and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yummy yep. desserts. Yep, yep. That's oh, nice. Okay, Michael, are you there? Michael Jackson? Yes, I am. Is there uh, anything you'd like to add or any questions you might have for our? No, I think that the questions are in the chat and the things that you brought up, uh, maybe give um, opportunity uh, as if, if there's a last call of questions and okay. anybody might have any questions, a good question. Uh, but then if not, then um, well, we just thank you so much for sharing this yeah, experience. Thank you for having and, me. Yeah. Yeah, and go over to time. Come visit. I guess we can get everything from gifts, party accessories, toys, dessert, entree, soup, and then you can roll down to the other place. Are you guys doing uh, curb service? at local mm -hmm. curb service and delivery so. awesome and get it and get some pizza yeah what's your favorite thing at local oh my gosh so we so i order once a week right now we're doing a family meal which is kind of fun so tonight i'm going to pick up chicken parmesan and salad but um what do we our standing order is pretty much the margarita pizza for the kids with a kid's pasta and then my husband always does the bolognese and then I love the crispy artichoke hearts and the chicken under a brick is delicious. So wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop the presses. Okay. <laughs> delicious. Yeah. What's in your bolognese? It is, it's veal, beef and pork. So it's all, oh, all yeah. the way, I love all it. Yes, <laughs> authentic. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to go get something to go over there. I know, come visit, I love it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone wants to know, what's your most popular dish? Here or at, um, at local? Uh, let's do both. Okay, I would say our most, oh God. I, our most popular dish here, like it varies. So like for the takeout, I would say our chicken enchiladas, um, where you just grab a tin of them and you take them home and you would cook them at home. Mm -hmm. um, our salad is probably the kale salad. Our sandwich, I'm going to say the chicken tarragon, but I'm not totally sure on that. Mm -hmm. And then our chocolate chip cookie is like delicious. It's so That's the funny. big, the big cookie, right? It's pretty big cookie. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, though that's what I would say here. And then down at local, I would say the chicken under a brick, our Brussels sprouts. And I mean, our pizzas are fantastic. Mm. We did this peach and burrata and prosciutto pizza this summer. What? That's like off the charts. It oh, was so good. So, good. I, so now it's persimmons, but I swear it's just as good with the persimmons. I was going to say, where are you getting peaches from? Pers no, now it's persimmons. He switched it out. It's really persimmons, good. prosciutto, and br burrata. Burrata. Oh, yeah. boy. It's the real thin pizza, you know? Yeah. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, Mulugeta says, why do you want to be a chef? Why did I, you know, I got to say, I graduated college and I don't think I knew what I wanted to be, but I've always loved cooking. And I, I, I'm definitely the person that works with my hands. Like I, what could, I'm like, I can sew, I, I learned knit, how to knit. Like I was always that person mm -hmm. and crafty, you know, um, I love to be busy. I worked in retail and I was so bored. I, <laughs> my mind. Um, so I just love to be busy and that's never a problem here. <laughs> you, know? you got that solved. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Maura, thank you so much. I really yeah, appreciate you. your story. And oh. it's so fun to get to know you. And yeah. I can't wait to taste all your delicious products. Aw, well, thank you. It was fun meeting you. And thanks, everybody, for joining. And then, yeah, Kathleen, let me know if you need anything else, okay? Will do. Okay, happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Carla.